Somewhere between 2009 and 2010, I was introduced to pastor, pastor and author, uh, John Bevere. Now, John, in many ways, has become a mentor to me from a distance as I have loved all the things that he's brought about, whether that's podcasts or sermons or books. They've helped me grow, and I just really appreciate the way he engages in Scripture. But the very first thing that I ever got to experience from him was an audio theatrical book entitled Rescued. And in this, John gives a hypothetical story of what it might be like to experience the afterlife and enter into the throne room of God. And in that experience, or in this story, he tells us about a pastor who has ultimately started to lose his way. Slowly but surely, he's no longer expressing the gospel and the, and the truth that it is and, and gets off course. While, while he and some of the people that attended his church were on a retreat, there was a horrific accident that took place. And he, along some of those members, were rushed into the throne room of God. Now, the pastor was excited at first because he had this expectation and hope that he would get to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, and watch people that he cared about enter in. But that joy started to fade as he started to witness the revelation of their heart in those words, depart from me, for I ever knew you be expressed. And when it became his turn to stand before God, he too heard those dreadful words. But as he was leaving that space, an angel of the Lord grabbed him and said, this would have been your fate, eternal separation, if it wasn't for the rescuing work that your son was doing on earth to give you just a few more moments of life. And in those few moments of life, he repented of his ways and then was able to express a message that was shared to countless people that sparked a revival. Now, the story is being told by his son in God's space to a woman who has just entered in. And at one point, she asked him this question, why are you telling me this story? And the son's response was, because it's my job. And after he uh, welcomed her into the throne room where there was cheering and celebration because she was hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant, he turns, the son turns to look at his father, a gardener, and they go hand in hand towards a sunset. Now, this book has radically impacted my life, and I've looked back upon it and listened to it multiple times because it's caused me to really think about what it would be like to enter into this space that the scriptures would tell me that at some point I will get there. And it really causes us to wrestle with what does it look like to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. But it also brought up a question in my heart that I didn't know was there. And that question was, what will we do after those words are expressed? Because in the book, John starts to allude to those things and I never really had thought about it prior. Well, today, as we continue in this series entitled Heaven and Hell, where we've spent the last few weeks, and we're going to spend a couple more, looking at what does Scripture say about the afterlife? And how do we have a foundation that is upon that a scriptural truth, scriptural truth, not a tooth, that's weird, um, scriptural truth, and not folklore or what we read in comic books or in stories? And last week, we started to engage in a conversation that we're picking up today, and we will continue in the next couple of weeks, is what will we experience? But today, specifically, we're going to be asking the question, what will we do? And so if you have your Bibles, you're going to open them up to Matthew chapter 13, um, because we're going to start this conversation by looking at a parable that Jesus gave to his disciples, now, for those of you who don't know what a parable is, a parable is a, st- a made-up story to point out truth. And Jesus right here is talking one-on-one with his disciples, his close friends. He has been just preaching about what the kingdom of God is, and they, everyone left, and they're in this little room, and he's, they're like, can you explain to me what you just said? That was a lie, and I'm not sure I'm tracking And so Jesus starts to explain to them what he was teaching. And then after that, he tells his followers these words in Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells 
all that he has and buys that field. Just pause on a moment and think about what Jesus is telling his disciples. What he's saying here is that if we understood the treasure, the the magnitude of that treasure that's awaiting us in the kingdom, that we would do everything in our lives to radically change our ways so we could obtain it. That's a massive statement to make. That if you understood the treasure that awaits you, that with everything in you, you would change your life. So the question then should become was, what is the treasure of heaven and what with joy in our hearts would cause us to change? And that's what we're gonna be looking at. Now, the treasures in heaven are are kind of expressed in many different ways throughout scripture, but the one I wanna look at today is one that not only tells us the treasure that is heaven, but I also think it points out to exactly what we will be doing with the knowledge of that treasure. So this is in Revelation chapter five, verses 13 and 14. And it says this, and I hear, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessed and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. It's saying here this, that all the creatures, all things that are created are pointing to the thing that is the treasure that is heaven. It's God. The treasure that is heaven that is, is God himself. And that we once again get to walk alongside and be in his presence like it was originally intended in Genesis chapters one and two, where it said that God walks amongst his people. That the treasure that is heaven is the fullness of God. That anything that we experience here on earth, little bits of joy or excitement, all the good that we experience here on earth are because of God, it's not gonna be partial, it's gonna be full. Right now we get glimpses of the treasure, but there'll be a day when that treasure is in its full form always. Now what do these, what do people and animals do in the midst of that? Is they worship. And so what we'll be doing in heaven is we will be worshiping. Now, when I say that, there's a couple of different responses. Some of you are like, yes, we get to sing, awesome. There's other of us who are more frozen and that's not our natural desire to sing. Or you have a voice only a mother can love, like myself. You're like, that sounds rough. And the reason we think that is because we've bought a lie of a Renaissance painting that says that we're gonna wear an adult version of this playing on a harp singing songs, because we've associated worship as that. But this is not worship. It's, it, it's not the fullness of worship. I can sing and worship, but singing doesn't equate worship. So then what exactly is worship? What does scripture declare to us that worship is? Well, he tells us, Jesus himself was actually asked this question here on earth. There's a story in John chapter four where Jesus is in um, this town. He sits at a well and his disciples have gone to the town to get food and a woman comes to him. And in that, they start having a conversation and she starts to press him a little bit. And one of the things that she presses him on is what is worship? She says to him, you Jews say that worship is something that takes place at a temple. We, the Samaritans, believe that it can happen here on this mountain. What is it? So he, herein lies that question, what is worship? And look at what Jesus says to her in John 4, 23. He says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Nowhere in that did God, that Jesus say that worship was singing of songs. Rather, he said it was something about the spirit and the truth. Ultimately, what he's saying is that what is inside of you and what you do with your hands 
is worship. Or simply put, worship is our life, not simply our voice. Now we get this, right? Like that the reality that what's inside us will eventually come out. Um, we have this saying in you know, our world that I can't say on stage, I might get in trouble, but when something hits the fan, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, it, the truth is revealed, right? What's inside of us will always come out. We were always designed to be worshipers. It's just the reality of it. And if you struggle with that, let me just ask you this question. Did anyone have someone in their life very devoted to the TV this weekend as they watch the NFL draft because they're hoping to better support their fantasy football team this coming year? <laughs> I see someone pointing. <laughs> Ooh, that's a, way, a hard way to call someone out, right? Like we have a desire to look towards things, but it's not just that. Anyone got a devotion to the latest fashion trends, the next celebrities, the types of jobs that we can get or have? By nature, if worship is devotion, it's ultimately what we're doing from the inside out. It's not hard to recognize that we are people who were designed to worship. And so when I say that in heaven, we get to experience worship, it's pure and authentic worship, the worship we were designed to do. It's not something that's gonna be boring, but something that's life-giving and life-thrilling. But then that lies the question, does that mean that I'm just gonna be in a diaper? <laughs> not at all. What it means is this, is that we're gonna look at ultimately three ways that scripture would say we would worship. Um, but it's not the, that's a short list of many ways we can worship. The first one is this, that we're going to worship through celebrating. In Revelation chapter 19, verse nine, it says that the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Right here, we are told that we will be invited to a celebration, a party, a wedding feast. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to a wedding, but when you go to a wedding, you recognize that it is not dull, but life enjoyable and life giving. It's a, it's a celebration, there's excitement, there's fun. It's not like you're just eating PB and J's and sweatpants. It's this amazing thing. And so what this is revealing to us is that we get to come and celebrate and feast and experience joy. Now, there are some people who would say, that this is simply hyperbole or imagery because the Bible has those things and this is just its way of trying to help us to understand that. Where I struggle with to under, that belief is that food and eating isn't a byproduct of sin. Because in Genesis chapter two, when after God created Adam, he tells them to eat of the fruits of the tree except for the one of knowledge and good and evil. And so if God is already commanding him to do something prior to sin, and not only that, does Jesus, after he's died and resurrected, we read three different times where he's eating and drinking with his friends, that food is not something that was a byproduct of sin, but rather something to be enjoyed as humans. And so we get to feast and we get to enjoy the food we're eating. It's not boring or just like, oh, we had to use, eat it to survive, but something that was nutritious and life-giving and satisfying. Now, I know this is gonna cause the question, well, what type of food are we gonna eat? Does that mean we're gonna eat a good steak? Can't say that for certain. Um, I do know that we'll probably eat from the fruit of the trees. If that means that we're ultimately gonna be vegans, it's gonna be the best vegan food we've ever had, but I'm not saying that's to be true. It just doesn't tell us. And we even get this picture even here on earth. See, when the Israelite people were walking through the desert, they were given a gift, and that gift was this thing called manna. Now, that word literally translates to, what is this? I don't know, it is. They had no idea what this thing was that was on the ground, but it was sweet, and it was life-giving and nourishing. And so here we start to see glimpses that food and celebration and feasting is not something that is a byproduct of sin, but rather what it means to be human. And so we get to actually feast and celebrate in the kingdom. But it's not just feasting that's gonna happen to take place. We're also gonna be celebrating by cheering one another on and supporting one another. 
In Luke 15, uh, 15 verse seven, it says, just so I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This scripture is telling us there is a celebration that takes place when someone chooses God's way over their own. Who's doing the celebration? It's us supporting one another, being excited for one another, enjoying each other's experiences that, hey, you've done it. You've chosen the right path. Congratulations, hurrah. It's this excitement that takes place. And so we are gonna be worshiping God purely and authentically worshiping him by celebrating, by doing life together. Yes, we are gonna sing songs as we saw that took place, but it's not simply just that. The next one that we see is that we will be worshiping purely and authentically by working and ruling. The pause is I was hoping for someone to go, ugh, because that's what most of us think when we think about work, right? What's the dreaded thing about tomorrow? It's Monday. I got to start work again. And so many of us, when we think about working, we see the dread of work and we have this belief that work is a byproduct of sin. And we get that idea from this passage of scripture that is in Genesis chapter three. So in Genesis chapter three, we are told that Adam and Eve chose to eat the forbidden fruit, the thing that they weren't supposed to. And when they eat of that fruit, there's a consequence from it. God is a good and gracious and righteous and pure judge. And so he stands before them. He holds court. You made a mistake. Here's the dishes, the consequences. And in this, we read in verse three, starting in verse 17, this. And God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. And from out of it, you were taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. I understand why if you're reading this at face value, you'd say, yeah, it sounds like work was cursed. Now we have these like phrases in our, in our culture that like when I say it, I'm talking about something completely different, but you know what I mean. For example, if I said that I have a tin can parked out back in the, in the gravel parking lot, am I talking about a tomato soup can? No, I'm talking about an old beat up car, right? It's a car that's like just hanging on by your life. Well, those types of phrases are scattered all throughout human history. And the phrase that we are told here was the sweat off your face or the sweat off your brow. Now that would literally translate to anxiety. And so it's not that work is cursed, is that now because of sin, your work brings you anxiety instead of joy. And that's what we dread. That's where the ugh comes from. It's not that we are working because we have those ideas in our lives that when I'm doing something that I love, I didn't realize how fast the time went. But when I'm doing something that I'm hating or only doing it because it gives me a financial gain or something else, I'm dreading it. I'm just counting the hours to go by. Because work is not something that is sin-filled. It's that we chose to do work outside of our original design. We took plans into our own hands. And so we will get to work righteously. Now we can see this actually truly take place in Genesis 1 where he tells us this in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The story of Genesis, it starts with God. It usually says this. It says like, in the beginning, God created and he spoke and this took place. But when he comes to humanity, he pauses and gives not only a little bit more context, but he also gives them a job after, right? He says, oh, I'm gonna create them in my image. And then right after he creates them, I'm gonna bless them with work. I'm gonna bless them with the ability to rule with me. 
In many ways, he was creating Adam and Eve to be a king and queen, but to do it in his ways and his, to, to partner with him to do it righteously. And he was there to rule over all the other created things beforehand. And then right after that, we see in Genesis 2, 19, that um, this, where he says, and now of the ground, the Lord had performed every, formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The first man had a job and it was to name animals, which I think is a pretty cool thing. I'm gonna be honest. Like if someone was just appear in front of me, that's a platypus. And from there on, that's what it is. It's pretty cool. But right here we see prior to sin, we don't see sin enter until, the, until later on, that God has already established them to rule with him and to work with him. And so working and ruling is not sin-filled. We'll see later on in Revelation that he too once again encourages us to do it. It's that for the first time in our lives, it will no longer bring us pain and toil, but rather joy and excitement because it's the ways in which we were worshiping him. Ultimately, the tasks no longer are just simply tasks, but there's joys of excitement. Revelation 21.4 says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Thou shalt be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Right? It's saying that those pains are gone. And what an amazing truth that is. That in the kingdom of heaven, all of that is wiped away, which it starts to reveal the last one, which is that we will purely and authentically worship by resting. By resting. Which is an awesome thing, but once again, it's, a, it's something that most people associate with rest as a need of sin. That, oh, like, well, we, there's not gonna be day and night. And Michael's already talked about that, about that's to talk about there's no more chaos, there's no more sin. And so we associate that, oh, like, we're just gonna be awake all the time. And where I struggle with that concept is once again, when we look back to prior to sin, in Genesis chapter one, the first time we see this phrase in verse five, is this, is this statement. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. On the very first day of God's creation, he created a rest period. There was day and there was night. And not only did he say that for the first day, but he did it for the first six days, that he had this rest period of day and night. But on, the, on Genesis 2, 2, we are told this. And on the seventh day, God finished his work and he did, and he rested. And so we can see that rest is not a byproduct of sin, but rather part of our human design. What I'm ultimately hoping that you're starting to see a picture about what scripture is appointing us to is that in the kingdom of heaven, the treasure that await us is that we get to be in the fullness of God and his presence and then get to experience the fullness of our design that we get to purely and authentically be human and live in a way that's all about worship and no longer ha- riddled with sin. But it's all these beautiful things that we've corrupted and, and now they're perfect and, bu- and wonderful and joyous. That is the treasure we await. Now, you might've picked this up when Jesus was talking to the woman when I read this because I think this is important to note, that in John 4, when he told her about what worship is, he said this, but the hour is coming and is now here. This worship, this style of worship isn't something we have to wait for, but it's something we're supposed to be starting today that because of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross, heaven was ushered in, that the pure, the treasure that we've all been longing for, the thing that we've been waiting for is present to us now. I don't have to wait for it because I've been given it and gifted it because of the death of resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I can purely and authentically worship today because of it. I don't have to wait. 
We live in this tension, however, of the already and the not yet. Right, because like, but I still struggle with work. I still experience these things. You're right. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we get to grasp it and taste it. I think Paul described it best when he'd said that to die is gain is to live for his glory. That yes, I wanna die. I wanna be with his presence. I wanna experience those things, but I don't have to wait for it. I get that glory now so I can live now knowing it. I don't have to wait to worship. I can do it today. But here's the sad reality about it. There are many of us today who have chosen not to worship yet. We've chosen to not radically change our lives and with joy do it. And so instead we, we worship our own things and build up our own kingdoms and, and go about our own ways instead of understanding the magnitude and the treasure that awaits us and starting to live that way. Well, this is a story in scripture where Jesus is uh, around some Pharisees and people are praising him and his glory and the Pharisees condemn them. And Jesus says to them, even if their mouths are closed, the stones will worship me. Now I want you to think about this. I picked this up on my way here. It was right next to my truck. This lifeless, soulless stone who could not move unless it was forced to by something or someone will steal my glory if I choose not to worship. That should grieve me that something this insignificant will take my job, my role, my natural design away from me. Because I am called to worship, but God's declared that if we choose not to, something has to, because he is worthy of worship. But remember, worship is not this. It's not sitting in a diaper, playing a harp. It's my life. And so am I gonna choose to worship God authentically and be the purest for myself and giving him glory and honor as I righteously commune with one another? As I righteously work, as I righteously rest, am I gonna do that or am I gonna allow something else to take my place as a worshiper? I don't know about you, but I will never and do everything in my power to not let this insignificant thing steal my design. And I pray that it is true for all of us that every time we see a pebble, it would give us a reason to praise because we were designed to worship, not this. So Heavenly Father, we come before you and give you thanks that you are the creator of heaven and earth and that when you created us, you created us with this desire to praise you and to glorify you. Lord, thank you that we, that, that we get access to this treasure and God, as we live in the tension between the already and the not yet, would you allow us to rest in you because you are a good and loving and compassionate God. And so God, we give you these things. In your name we pray, amen.